Book 6. The day before the king's intended decision as to whether Calerho was to be Charius's wife or Dionysius's, all Babylon was up in the air about it. When talking to one another at home, and when they met in the streets, people said, Tomorrow is Calerho's wedding day. Who is going to end up the lucky man? The city was split in two. Those on Charias' side said, He was her first husband. She was a virgin when he married her. He loved her, and she loved him. Her father gave her to him. Her fatherland buried her. He did not abandon his wife, and was not abandoned by her. Dionysius did not win her. He did not marry her. Pirates sold her, but he could not buy a freeborn woman. Dionysius' supporters replied, he rescued her from a crew of pirates when she was going to be murdered. He paid a talent to save her life. First he saved her, then he married her. When Charias married her, he killed her. Calerho should remember her marriage. And the biggest thing in favor of Dionysius' victory is the fact that they also share a child. That was what the men said. As for the women, they not only made speeches, they gave Calerho advice as if she were there. Do not abandon your first husband, they said. Choose the man who first loved you, your own countrymen, so that you can see your father too. If you do not, you will choose to live an exile in a foreign land. Those on the other side said, Choose your benefactor, your savior, not the man who killed you. What if Charias has another fit of anger? Will that mean another burial? Do not betray your son. You should respect your child's father. This is how you could hear people talking. You would have thought Babylon was one big courtroom. The last night before the trial had arrived, the royal couple lay abed with different thoughts passing through their minds. The queen was praying for the day to come more quickly so that she could put from her the burden of her charge. The woman's beauty could be compared with hers at close quarters, and that was a trial to her. Besides, she was suspicious of the king's frequent visits and unreasonable attentions. Up till now, he had rarely entered the women's quarters, but ever since she had had Calerho with her, he had been a constant visitor, and she repeatedly caught him glancing surreptitiously at Calerho, even when he was talking to her, his eyes wandering unconsciously in her direction as he kept stealing a look at her. So Tatira was looking forward to the next day with pleasure, but the king was not. He lay awake all night, lying now on his side, now on his back, now face down. Preoccupied, he said to himself, the moment of judgment has arrived. I was too hasty. I set too early a date. What am I going to do tomorrow? Calerho will soon be leaving for Miletus or Syracuse. Unhappy eyes, you have one hour left to enjoy that fairest of sights. And after that, my slave will be happier than I. My soul, consider what you should do. Search within yourself. You have no one else to advise you. Only love can advise a lover. So first answer your own question. Who are you, Calerho's lover or her judge? Don't deceive yourself. Though you may not realize it, you are in love. It will be all the more evident when she is gone from your sight. Then why deliberately hurt yourself? The son, your ancestor, has chosen this creature specially for you, the fairest of all he surveys. And are you driving the god's gift away? Much I care for Charius and Dionysius, my humble slaves, to arbitrate their marriages. I, the great king, acting as a marriage broker like an old woman. But no, I was the one who took it upon myself to judge this case, and everybody knows it. And above all, I could not look Tatira in the eye. Well then, neither broadcast your love, nor bring the trial to an end. It is enough for you just to see Calerho. Postpone your decision. 
even an ordinary judge can do that. So, when the day dawned, the servants set about the, getting the royal courtroom ready. The crowds rushed to the palace, but all Babylon was in commotion. Just as you can see the competitors at Olympia arriving at the stadium escorted by a procession, so you could see these contestants. The Persian nobility escorted Dionysius, the people Charius. The supporters of each sent up prayers and innumerable cries. You are the better man, they shouted in encouragement. You are the winner. But the prize was not a wreath of wild olive or fruit of or pine, but supreme beauty, for which the gods themselves might fitly have contended. The king called for the eunuch Artaxtes, who was highly in favor with him, and said, The royal gods had appeared to me in a dream, and are demanding sacrifice. I must carry out my religious duty. That is my first obligation. So give the order for all of Asia to observe a sacred month of festival for 30 days. All lawsuits and business are to be set aside. The eunuch issued the order as he had been instructed, and immediately the whole country was full of people garlanded and offering sacrifice. There was the sound of flute, the sirens piping, of people singing, incense burned in the entries of houses. Every street held a banqueting party. The savor rose to heaven, swirling in the smoke. The king set magnificent sacrifices by the altars. Then, for the first time, he sacrificed to Eros and repeatedly called on Aphrodite to help him propitiate her son. In this general rejoicing, three people only were sad. Calerho, Dionysius, and above all, Charius. Calerho would not show open distress in the royal palace. But secretly, she sighed to herself under her breath, cursing the festival. As for Dionysius, it was himself he cursed for leaving Miletus. Miserable wretch, he said, you will have to put up with this disaster. It is your own fault. It is you who are responsible for what is happening. You could have kept Calerho even though Charius was alive. You were master of Miletus. The letter would never even have reached Calerho against your will. Who would have seen it? Who would have had access to Calerho? But you rushed to throw yourself among your enemies. And if it were only just you, but it is a possession more precious to you than your life. That is why you find yourself attacked on all sides. Why, what do you expect, you fool? You have Charius as your opponent in this trial and you have made your lord and master your rival in love. Now, the king is having dreams on top of everything else. The gods he sacrifices to every day are demanding sacrifices from him. The shamelessness of it, dragging out the trial while he has another man's wife in his palace, and a man like that claims to be a judge. Such were Dionysius' complaints, but Charius would not touch food. He had lost all desire to live. His friend Polycharmus tried to stop him from committing suicide. You pretend to be my friend, he said, but you are my worst enemy. You are holding me down while I am tortured. You like to see me punished. If you were my friend, you would not grudge me my liberty, persecuted as I am by some evil power. How many times have you destroyed my chance of happiness? I would have counted myself happy to be buried in Syracuse with Calerho when she was being buried, but then you too prevented me from killing myself and robbed me of her sweet company on the way to the tomb. Indeed, perhaps she would not have left the tomb if it meant leaving my body behind. In any event, I should be lying there now. I should not have been spared what followed, being sold, attacked by robbers, put in chains, crucified, and a king more cruel than the cross. How sweet death would have been after I heard that Calerho had married again. And again, what an opportunity you spoiled for me of doing away with myself after the trial. 
I saw Calor Ho and did not go to her, did not embrace her. It is unheard of. It is passes belief. Charius on trial to determine whether he is Calor Ho's husband, and even this question, for what it is worth, the malicious deity will not be allowed to decide. In dream and in reality alike, the gods hate me. With those words, he made to seize his sword, but Chali Polycharmus managed to restrain him and watched him very closely, almost to the point of tying him up.